Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to part two of the annual demographic workshop, the 33rd annual. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, convene this meeting today. My name is Dal Myers, a professor in the Price School of Public Policy at USC. I'm just going to uh, kick it off here with a brief recap of what happened in day one. All this has been recorded, so you can actually look at the presentations and um, uh, the roundtables that we did in, in the previous day. But uh, we, we had a heck of a, a great demographic checkup this year. We do it every year. And everything's changing every year. Birth rates changing, migration changing. Um, Walter Schwarm is the uh, state demographer, uh, chief for the, in the Department of Finance. And Beth Giraz is from the Population Reference Bureau. And she dealt with some delicate issues about changing migration behavior that could occur because of state differences now in their laws governing reproductive rights. That's a new wrinkle we have not had before. And it does have consequences potentially for Texas and other places vis-a-vis -vis California. So she raised the questions in, in a framework that was really stimulating to think about. So will people vote with their feet? Uh, and Janet Goldberg was a moderator. Uh, she's a USC alum and she's the uh, chief of, uh, of uh, consumer research in, for Wayfair. And she was very um, helpful in, in posing questions as well. The second panel was more about the housing and mobility side. I, I actually went first there because I want to set a broader framework of the population age waves. That's basically the millennials crashing into a, a housing supply that's not growing. Uh, and then uh, Kevin followed with uh, uh, different stories about migration. Are they true or not? And it had, had, um, it revealed with data what, how things have shifted. And it's, you know, the beginning of the pandemic is different than the middle of the pandemic and the end is different. So actually, whatever you knew before is not true anymore. It's, it's, it's you got to pay attention here. <laughs> There's a lot to keep up with and the data are lagging behind. So it's, it's a problem. Laura Raymond uh, brought us a, a really uh, a, a, a difficult, frustrating problem of single family rental investors uh, scooping up uh, homes. Um, this is a, a national perspective, especially in the Sun Belt and, and a big problem in Atlanta where she comes from. And it leads to uh, problems of real homeowners not being able to buy them because investors can get them with cash or with better bank terms. And it's uh, leading to eviction problems and gentrification problems. Uh, it's a growing phenomenon because in the tight housing supply, the values are rising in this investment. And so big capital swoops in. Uh, you know, that really didn't, didn't happen until the, after the Great Recession. Um, and Megan Kirkaby is from the uh, Department of Housing and Community Development for California. And she moderated that. And she's very active in promoting expansion of housing supply to meet affordable needs. Um, so we had a great discussion there. Uh, that was followed by uh, roundtables that came up. These are, you know, the demographic workshop gets its, its title workshop from these roundtables. We have the panels up front, the roundtables at the back of the afternoon. And these are like uh, really a chance for one one to one feedback and you can really you know get questions and answers. Uh, Armando Mendoza is from the Census Bureau, and he he gave a, a tour of how to navigate data.census.gov. It's very useful. They've expanded the this data this website. It's getting more complicated. There's more data available. Uh, there's no proce new procedures, and we've got to we all need retraining. I think Tom Brinkhouse uh, from HCD. Uh, surveyed their annual progress report dashboard. So you can see well, how well are all the locale localities doing in providing for the housing they promised they were gonna do. In the past, HCD didn't really monitor uh, progress very well. Uh, and, and now they're watching it closely, they're raising the, the goals and watching the progress. Uh, and then Jonathan Buttle is from the uh, State Department of Finance uh, in the Demographic Research Unit. Actually, that's the State Data Center. Uh, and he is he he was dealing with a um, very thorny issue, and it's come up in 2020 census of differential privacy. They're trying to figure out how to protect individual privacy by disguising the data so that people can't reverse engineer it by combining different data sets together to find who, who individuals are. And it's been a source of a lot of controversy because um, it's 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 difficult to do. 
but they have strong reason to do it, I, I, I've learned, um, because they really need to protect privacy or else the, the whole purpose of the Bureau is, is gonna be undermined. And that's all happening now. So a lot to do those, those round tables are, are, are great. And we're gonna have a different set of round tables uh, I'll introduce later uh, at the end of the, after the panels that, that we're gonna do today. All right, <clears throat> so um, that's, that's the recap. Now I'm, I'm going to um, actually turn over most of the day here now to um, Kevin Kane and Gigi uh, Marino who really have mastermind setting up panels and uh, activities for uh, day two. And Kevin though has an extra, <laughs> extra burden that fell on him uh, because between day one and day two, breaking news, we had a whole load of 2021 American Community Survey data landed in public. And, uh, but Kevin whipped up with, with Gigi and my help a little bit, whipped up a report that summarizes that. You're not gonna present the report, but it's gonna show you how you can get your own copy. So Kevin, why don't you uh, just give a quick little look at it? Well, so the, you know, the, the pandemic has not only increased the demand for data uh, in order to help us forecast the new normal, uh, as you see there at the bottom of the screen, but to some degree, it's also limited the supply of it. Uh, so as Dowell mentioned last week, right after part one of the workshop, the American Community Survey's 2021 one-year estimates were released. Uh, this is data that we've been waiting for for about two years, and it can give us something of a first look um, at how various uh, regions uh, across the country uh, look in the post-COVID environment. There's always a lot to unpack in the ACS, but fortunately the, the demographic workshop team here has put together the highlights uh, in a handy report available here for you. Um, you can use this QR code or uh, navigate to it on our website. Uh, there's way too much to talk about here today. On the next slide here, uh, I show how we report on 16 topics, uh, the kind of 16 high points that intersect with regional planning pretty nicely in, in Southern California. Um, and I'll uh, highlight just uh, one of these as a bit of a teaser. Um, the graph here shows the share of commuters who work from home, and clearly you can see uh, a major increase, and that's the topic of some of the discussion today. So for all 16 of these topics that we report on, you can follow the trend from the peak of the real estate boom in 2006 to the low point of the Great Recession in 2012 to uh, a pre-pandemic high in 2019, uh, and then see how things have changed in the last two years. So uh, I'd encourage you to take a look at this uh, after the conclusion of the workshop. Uh, and with that, we have a keynote coming up next. Um, and right now, it's my pleasure to introduce SCAG's Director of Planning and Programs, Sarah Jepson, uh, who will set the stage up for that uh, and introduce today's keynote speaker. Sarah? Thank you, Kevin, and thank you, Dal, and thank you, Gigi. It's really a pleasure to be here today with you all. Um, I have the honor of introducing Matthew Kahn to deliver our keynote address for the demographic workshop. Um, Matthew must suffer from impeccable timing because just as we're all wondering how to plan for the new post-pandemic normal, um, he's released a brand new book on the benefits of remote work. Um, so I can only imagine the number of requests and opportunities you've had to share your insights. And I'm really uh, thankful that you chose our event here today um, to talk with Southern California planners and our policymakers. Uh, Dr. Khan is a pro provost professor of economics at the University of Southern California, where he focuses on urban and environmental economics. He is also a research research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research and a fellow at the IZA Institute of Labor Economics. Dr. Khan serves as the Director of Health Markets Initiative at the Schaefer Center for Health Policy and Economics at USC. In addition to teaching at USC, Dr. Khan has taught at Columbia, UCLA, Johns Hopkins, University, Harvard, and the oh. National University of Singapore in Stanford. Uh, Dr. Khan is a prolific writer. He has published 11 books and nearly 200 peer-reviewed articles. Some of his recent books include Adapting to Climate Change, Unlocking the Poten Potential of Post-Industrial Cities, and of course here today we're going to talk about going remote. Um, we will have a time for a short Q&A after this uh, uh, his keynote presentation. So please be thinking about your questions and put them in the um, Q&A feature. And we will try to get to as many of those as possible. Um, so with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Dr. Matthew Kahn. Thank you for joining us. Sarah, thank you. Folks, I'm honored to have been invited to speak today briefly about my new book, 
Well, my new book is National in Scope. I want to focus on our beloved Southern California today. And please email me any of your thoughts. I'm hoping that this is the beginning of a discussion, not the end of a discussion. The rise of work from home will improve quality of life in Southern California. This is the thesis I want to argue. And let me show you my thoughts. But first, I'm going to show you my book cover. Now I've got it. So folks, I did not design this cover, but we are going wild. I want to go back one. I did not design this cover, but I love it. And, um, and by, by going remote, we are jumping across slides. I believe that work from home is here to stay. And a bunch of economists using data are documenting that, our, that going forward in our post-pandemic economy, that we will continue to be working from home. And so Nick Bloom of Stanford and several co-authors, I wanna show you this time series graph by the Stanford researchers. Uh, I wanna show you this graph that what we're seeing here is th this enormous jump in work from home that occurred when the COVID crisis began in March, 2020. And while the share working from home has declined, there is a consensus in the economics literature that going forward, hybrid work and remote work, full remote work, that roughly 30% of our workforce going forward could be engaging in work from home on any given day, if either through full-time work or remote work. And of course, the people who qualify here, this is a privileged group. Uh, if you make it, if you produce steel, you can't do that from home, neither can a dentist, but of identifying those industries and occupations that are amenable to work from home. And these tend to be college graduate jobs. And I'll come back to this question of whether work from home is elitist. Edward, next slide, please. So I want to flash back. I argue in the first chapter of my book that a silver lining of the COVID crisis is that we had this experience. Edward, can I ask you to go back to 2019? So my book is set in the year 2030, but I want to go back to 2019. And so I, I apologize that we're having some pauses here. I, uh, in the year 2019, we faced the challenge uh, that we were commuting. We were commuting too much. A Southern California featured extremely high home prices. We were stuck in traffic. We faced challenges in our center cities uh, with respect to schooling and, and just a, a quality of life challenges. And a key point in my book is the bundling issue. We had to live close to where we work. We were not footloose. Before the work from home experiment that we've run, we had to live in commuting distance uh, close to where we work. Next slide, please. When you flash forward, and my book is set in, a, in the co post COVID period, think of the year 2030. I'm thinking ahead about the opportunities Southern California and all cities around the US. What opportunities and challenges we'll face going forward in an economy featuring persistent work from home? When workers are un unbundled, when workers no longer need to live so close to where we work, how does this affect where we choose to live? How does this affect our quality of life? How does this affect traditional job core areas like downtown Los Angeles, downtown San Diego? How does this affect the suburbs? And how will new exurbs, what are new opportunities in unincorporated land for those parts of Southern California that are, want to grow and that we overcome the nimbyism we often face in the region? And that's going to be the heart of my talk today. I'm going to offer five predictions when I look into my crystal ball about the future of the Southern California region. So a, a bad joke, Kevin Bacon, when he was young, had that movie Footloose. And so I want you thinking you can even sing the Footloose, I think Kenny Loggins song to yourself if you're from that generation, and think about when we're Footloose, where do we choose to live our lives and how does this accommodate our diversity? Next slide, please. Prediction number one, and I apologize for my busy slides. Work from home workers are diverse. Uh, we differ by age. The, the, my son who's 20 really doesn't want to work from home. My parents at age 80 still working have had more success because they were working from home. In the Southern California region, some will want cheaper, larger homes. And of course, housing is cheaper, newer, and larger further from the job course. This demand for living further 
and going out into Riverside, San Bernardino, into Ventura is even greater if, if quality of life is high in those destination areas. Something that I want to speak to the SCAG members about is which SCAG districts will be excited about having people move to their areas. I've been on radio shows in Bozeman, Montana, where, where these areas have not been excited at all about people showing up. They, they don't want uh, these city slickers showing up, and they didn't like my Billy Crystal jokes about the city slickers movies. I am very interested in which SCAG districts are excited about the potential for new real estate development or will the old NIMBY issues that we see all throughout California just break out again? The bottom bullet point is very important to me. Some of friends who have talked to me about my book have said, Matt, work from home is elitist because only a subset of educated people can really engage in work from home. I have replied to not forget the local multiplier effect. If there are parts of Southern California that attract work from home workers, this creates new demand for schools, for dental care, for solar panel installation, for bartenders. There's a whole service economy where people who have leisure tastes and who want to live in, in areas far from our traditional job course can now decentralize and pursue their own conception of the good life. So as footloose work from home workers, workers choose to live in areas with great quality of life, either due to God or due to wise urban planning, it, the local multiplier effect kicks in and there will be middle class jobs in those areas due to the rising service economy. And I'd love to discuss this. Next slide, please. The next prediction I want to talk about and it comes back to quality of life. Here you see my two co-authors, Daryl Fairweather and Sebastian, and we are doing work on how home searchers were using data from Redfin, the platform Redfin, a Zillow competitor, and we're documenting that those who are searching for housing care very much about avoiding climate risk. Our project focuses on flood risk, but in California, fire risk is another issue. Those SCAG areas that prove themselves to be resilient in the face of rising heat, fire risk, flood risk, they will attract more of the footloose workers. And so a very interesting competition is about to play out for attracting footloose people in our emerging work from home economy. Next slide, please. What I'm going to show you in the next two slides are some examples of climate data. So First Street Foundation is a nonprofit that I work with. And for every property in the United States, First Street Foundation is reporting flood scores and fire scores. And I realize that fire scores are more important uh, to people in Southern California. I once lived in this house. So unbeknownst to me, we lived in a home in Belmont, Massachusetts that faced very low flood risk, but we did not know this when we bought this house. And so there's increased information for home buyers, many of whom will be work from home workers as they search for what's the right place for them. And again, those areas in Southern California that are more resilient in the face of fire risk and high heat, will those home investments will prove to be more profitable and enjoyable going forward. Next slide, please. The next slide shows some geography of extreme heat in the Los Angeles area. Alex Hall is a terrific climate scientist at UCLA. So even though I'm at USC, I celebrate excellent science being done at UCLA. What Alex Hall is doing is he's using downscaled climate models to show you for different parts of our region how many days a year have there been recently over 95 degrees Fahrenheit. And the red bar represents the climate science of at mid-century how many extra hot days there will be. So in Silmar, in Porter Ranch, in Eagle Rock, I see a jump in the number of hot days as these areas compete for work from home workers. How can urban shading be used? How can architecture be adapted to make to keep quality of life great, even as Mother Nature hits us with higher heat towards the east of the region? And so I talk in my book about sort of the Paul Revere effect. If we can anticipate these challenges, these areas further from the cool water can better compete for these footloose workers. Next slide, please. I'm going to slide into prediction number two. Folks, this one's a little more controversial, but I know I'm among friends and I, I could stir the pot. As an economist, 
economists, um, I hope you know that economists are, uh, we're, we're slightly annoying people. We always think about what's the best alternative use for scarce resource. I, of course, understand why we farm in California, but in Ventura, Riverside, and San Bernardino, farmland in a work from home economy has an alternative use. It could, some of it could be turned into work from home housing. I would love to talk to SCAG government officials about whether they are debating rezoning some of the land in their jurisdictions to be converted into residential housing. If I can be an environmental bad boy, if we actually reduce some of our farming in the region, this actually would conserve water given the water consumption of farming. And as someone deeply concerned about housing affordability in the region, if we convert some of our farmland into work from home housing, this creates a new menu of opportunities for middle class people increasing housing affordability in the region if we can navigate the NIMBY issue. Next slide, please. And the good news is there's only five predictions. I'm on a time delay maybe to avoid a cursing like the seven second rule. Folks, it's also very important. My book, uh, my book is clever. My mother would say that it's too clever. My book thinks about destination areas and it thinks about origin areas. For places like Los Angeles, San Francisco and Los Angeles lost people. The Los Angeles Times keeps writing about this. We lost people during the COVID crisis. I'm very interested in the idea that the rise of work from home makes a uh, educated people more footloose. And this means that center cities like Los Angeles and San Diego are gonna to have to raise their game to keep upper middle-class people living there. Uh, I hope that they experiment with public school innovation and experiment with different ways to provide key public goods.